Welcome to the Celtic Myth Pod Show, bringing the tales and stories of the ancient Celts to your fireside. Episode SP33, 2013 New Year Party Show. Hello, welcome to the Celtic Myth Pod Show. I'm Gary. And I'm Ruth. And thank you so much for joining us for our special 2013 New Year Party Show. We hope you enjoy all the fun. Yeah, it's going to be rocking. We've got some great things to get you in the right mood for a sparkling year. So what have we got? Well, settle back and enjoy seven, yes, seven again, pieces of beautiful music, a short piece by our resident bard, Chris Jolliffe, and a wonderful story from that magical inn, The Fosty Knoll, by our friend Craig Sackett. Oh, well, that sounds amazing, and I'm really looking forward to Craig's story too. We haven't heard one yet, have we? No. Mm. And links to all our musical guests can be found on the special Friends of the Show page on our website, as well as in the show notes as normal. The amazing thing is, three of those friends have released brand new albums for you to enjoy, so we've got tracks from each album in the show. That sounds great. I can't wait. Should we start by cracking open the bubbly? No, I want you upright by the end of the show. <laughs> <laughs> OK, then. Well, a bit, a bit, a bit later? Yeah, OK, then. Oh, OK. So where are we going to start? <laughs> well, the first of our brand new albums is Dave the Bard's Antler Crown and Standing Stone. And he's recorded a wonderful version of the Keridwin and Taliesin story with Kate Fletcher as Keridwen. Kate's been on the show before, hasn't she? With her other half, Corwen. That's right, with the Cheshire Souling song in SP26. She helped Dave out with the song and retells the story of Taliesin and his chase with Keridwen. Really does get the blood pounding. Have a listen. From the mists of Tegged Shore A lady looks upon her son Like many times before And she touches his face Fingers wet With the tears falling Her daughter stands beside her The fairest in the land How her son became so cursed She cannot understand But this mother's love is as strong as her heart is beating And she calls to the earth And the earth hears her calling Stands tall, all magic and all mysteries are held within these walls. So she walks to the door, as she does, the door it opens. Teach to me the mystery of the cauldron's brew. Let utter darkness give way to light and be reborn anew. Then the hour when will shine. From the brow of the eagle of the sea And all will know his name From this land to the people of the sheep Set the cauldron's fire, tended by the hand of Brion Bark, the inner 
innocent and more to the blind man who reached out his hand. Place more wood, keep the cauldron boiling. Then Morda, he fell asleep, alas, he didn't see. Wood upon wood was added, the inferno was the key to unlock the door of the Arwen's greatest mystery. Three drops burning skin, and it's Gwion who gained the power to see. The poison creeps slowly across the land To kill the horses of Garanir At the lake shore where they stand Drinking, not knowing their fate As a hare runs fast across the land Keridwen, Keridwen, lady of the cauldron Come see what they have done Stolen your cauldron's power And betrayed your only son your eyes wide, lips curl, anger on your face. Change your shape now, lady. Be the hound. Begin the chase. Begin the chase. I shall be a running hare with sorrow and with mickle care. Then I shall be a greyhound bitch and tear you from your skin. Then I shall be a flying wren, the king of birds, the king of men. So I shall be a falcon grey and tear you from your skin. Then I shall be a salmon sleek, darting through a shallow creek. So I shall be an otter bitch and arrest you from your skin. I shall be a grain beneath the sun and you will never know which one. Then I shall be a great black hen and take you deep within. tale is over and done But nine moons later she gave birth to a son that she wanted to kill But she placed in a coracle on the sea Garanir salmon weir a catch was guaranteed But on this day a baby boy cried out to be free A radiant brown Shining bright for all to plainly see Taliesin is your name The greatest part that this land will ever see was Dave the Bard with Keridwen and Taliesin, a song from his brand new album, Antlet Crown and Standing Stone. An absolutely amazing song, and you'll find all the details in the show notes. 
Is it true that Kate and Corwin are well known for their historic research into folk songs and old instruments? Yes, it is, and you can find out more about their work at ancientmusic.co.uk. And on the subject of traditional tunes, I'd like to welcome our next guest to the show. Ah, I see the beautiful Anne Roos setting up her harp. Yes, she's going to play a medley of three old English tunes for us from her album, A Light in the Forest. Wow, OK, let's listen to the amazing Anne Roos. English tunes from her album A Light in the Forest. She really is a superb musician. Do we know what each of the three tunes were by any chance? Ah, yes, yes. The first 
was called Gamble Gold. The second, the Abbot's Bromley Horn Dance. And the third is called The Green Man. Oh, that's wonderful. I thought that Abbot's Bromley rung a horn dance rung a bell. Did you know that the first recorded instance of the Abbot's Bromley horn dance was in August 1226? No. <laughs> Amazing, huh? <laughs> How many could even say that? <laughs> <laughs> the next time it takes place is the 9th of September this year, and that's 787 years of dancing. Wow. Do you know, I'd actually love to see that in real life. I never it, have. I think it's, I think we've actually, I think it's actually on YouTube. You yeah, can see but it on it's there, not but the it same. Would, I'd love no, to go there. it would there. be nice to go, wouldn't yeah. it? Yeah, my feet would be worn away. Mm, mine too. Let's try and get some pictures of this ancient custom in the show notes. We might even find the YouTube link as well. Yeah, that's a good idea. Let's have some more music. Now, yes. What about our friend Kevin Skinner? He's made a great piece of rousy music to get us all moving in the new year called The Dance of Kanunos. Great stuff. Let's listen to Kevin Skinner with The Dance of Kanunos.
Always good, isn't he? That was Kevin Skinner with his track, The Dance of Kenonos, from his album, Fire Walk With Me. Yes, and he's made some absolutely beautiful atmospheric music. Definitely go and have a listen to his album. Yep. Anyway, time to give music a break for a while. Definitely. I think it's time we gave the floor to our resident bard, Chris Jolliffe. Brilliant. What's he got for us this time? Well, this is a wonderful poem, all about the things that dwell in the shadows and how important it is to keep our hearth fires well tended. It's called Winter Wick. Winter Wick by Chris Jolliffe Long nights, short days, cold and ice gathering by the window, waiting to come in. Snow and stillness, air too bright to breathe, but only sound the keening knife of the wind. There is a silence that quiets the soul with disquiet. The eye sees death in all things, and the heart flutters with mortality. Within the bright lit houses candles burn, the room scent heavy with smoke and tallow, and the smell of beast and man, islands of safety from the dark. Flame burns, always flickers, the fierce fragile hearth keeps hope and life alive, for outside life is malign and seeks to kill. Things stir in the shadows, between the black bare trees, there is hunger written in red upon the snow. Know this as you lay your axe on your shoulders' ragged furs, you trespass in death's domain. Your frozen tread marks out your passing in the abode of shades and spirits. Those tracks you lead lead back to your door. It is a trail you cannot hide and shall be followed. Eyes shall watch you, teeth shall hunger. Quiet paws shall mark your every step. Should you falter, should you slow, then as the weakest of the herd, the pack will pick you out, and you shall hear the hunter's call. Pray then that your strength is enough, your fire still burns within. For when the chill stills up in you as you run, when the sharp ache in your side cuts breath from your stride, when the first fall breaks your faith, and when you first look back, then is your fate laid bare upon the snow, red written in the letters of your life. Thus I tell you, keep the firelight bright. Feed the flames before you think to feed yourself, and know the shortening of the days within the tallow's burning wick. Wow, what an incredibly powerful piece of writing. Thank you so much, Chris. It's quite amazing, isn't it? He highlights the the prey to the hunter, and it's very you quite often hear poems from the but not the prey back to the hunter, which is quite interesting and quite spooky. I might add. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> and the fire of new life and the death of the year. So well, it's all very, very good poems. It's the right time, isn't it? Mm, as well. Certainly. So after that reminder to tend our fires well, should we have some more music? Yes. Okay. Let's make the flames roar with the wonderful Keltorius track, Spiral Dance.
That was Keltoria with their track Spiral Dance. And their album, Leofal, which, as you know, is the Stone of Destiny. Mmm, they make such beautiful music. Although you've probably heard them many times before in the show, I think this is the first time we've actually featured them on a special show, isn't it? I think it? you're right. Mm. But as you can hear, very talented musicians, and we'll hear more from them in the future. I'm sure we will. It's also a strange coincidence that the track was called Spiral Dance because the next band we've got on our party list is the amazing Australian band Spiral Dance. Yay! <laughs> we've actually been to see them, haven't we? Yes, and they were superb live. And they're amazing on their albums too. That's true. Adrienne has such a fantastic voice and uh, they're just a, such an amazing bunch of musicians. Wonderful. And not only that, but they've released a brand new double album called through a sylvan doorway and not only can you hear their amazing track winter's dreaming now but you can also expect to hear more from them in the future oh definitely without a doubt <laughs> so let's have a listen to the fabulous spiral dance with their track winter's dreaming Just one touch and I'll go with you Just one kiss and you'll be mine Just one touch 
how such a tragic love song has really got us jumping. It's incredible, isn't it? It is, yeah. <laughs> that was Winter's Dreaming from the album Through a Sylvan Doorway by the fabulous Spiral Dance from Australia. Somehow they managed to combine Adrienne's magical vocals with the power of the guitar and bass, as well as the fiddle and an accordion to make a totally unique sound. That's true. Absolutely amazing band. Their stage presence raises so much energy as well. Certainly does. We're reaching out and holding hands with you all right around the wonderful world. Happy New Year to you guys in the Southern Hemisphere. We're thinking of you now as well. I think it's time for the story. Can you tell us something about it? Well, this story, hopefully, is the first of many. It's by our friend Craig Sackett and tells us the beginnings of his tales about the magical and the mysterious inn known as the Fosty Knoll. And it's even more mysterious innkeeper, Rafferty Brown. Not only are we introduced to this magical inn found deep within the forest, but we also hear one of Rafferty's tales, the tale of two rivals. The Fosty Knoll by Craig Sackett Many years ago, when my seasons were few and the moon was still bright, I wrote a short introduction to a story I intended to compose. It featured a tavern which sat at the heart of an ancient forest. Very few visitors knew of the inn's existence, and most who came across it did so entirely by chance. Even fewer folk found it a second time. Only one traveller has ever crossed its threshold thrice. Legend had it that the inn would lift up its very foundations, gather its oaken beams, and carry itself to a new clearing in the forest every full moon. Were you to ask Rafferty Brown, the innkeeper, if the myth was indeed true, he would simply chuckle to himself 
throw you a wink and tap the side of his nose knowingly. A strange old fellow was Rafferty Brown, and stranger still was his inn, the Fosty Knoll. Stumbling across the inn from the forest, a rather confused traveller would first notice the glowing lights coming from the mysterious establishment. From the stained glass windows would dance a myriad of colours upon the path before the traveller, luring him closer still. If the smell of roasted meats or freshly baked bread didn't call to the traveller's hungry belly, the sound of laughter, music and song from within the inn would certainly raise the spirits of any weary journeyman. With curious apprehension, a traveller might knock on the Niles oak door and wait, listening to hear the sound of approaching footsteps from within. A moment or two later, the door would creak open, revealing a friendly fellow stood in the doorway, inviting the lost soul inside for warmth, shelter and merriment. With such a dark night outside and a moonlit path seemingly leading nowhere but around the inn itself, the traveller would step into the frosty knoll willingly. Rafferty Brown would lead his new guest to the hall, where sat a table and a chair and a steaming bowl of broth with a cool mug of ale. Any traveller would gratefully accept the food, and while eating to their heart's content, Rafferty would sit beside the fire and tell his old stories stories known as the Tales of the Frosty Knoll. So what on earth is a Frosty Knoll anyway? Uh, that's a question I often get asked, chuckles Rafferty Brown, leaning in towards his curious companion. The old innkeeper scratches his stubbled chin, rolling his eyes or pondering on where to begin. The start of things is often connected to the end, you see, and it's only the middle that keeps them apart. If ever the two met, we, oh, we'd all be in a terrible state, so it's a good thing that the middle is where it is and not at the start and neither at the end. I knew a tall man once who started at the end, skipped the whole of the middle, and before he knew where he was, he ended up at the start, without any idea of how he got there. And as I recall, he had a limp too. His left leg. What an odd fellow, if you ask me. A polite cough from his companion <coughs> had Rafferty leave the tall, limping man and return to the question at hand. He decided the best place to start was at the beginning, work his way through the middle, and if all went well, he'd be at the end before tea time. A fusty knoll, eh? Hmm, let me see. Hmm. Best way to describe a fusty knoll is to show you my ears. Rafferty lifted back his scraggly hair to reveal two rather large ears sticking out proudly from the sides of his head. And while his ears were entirely functional, as the rain was facing southwards as Rafferty was off to point out, they were considerably flappy and not at all in proportion to the rest of the innkeeper's head. Some folk might even be of the mind that they were a rather ugly pair of ears, although few were rude enough to mention it in front of the innkeeper for fear of offending their host. My ears are rather an ugly pair of flappers, don't you think? My pa used to say my ma would hang me up by my ears on her washing line. I know he was only pulling the leg. I was born with these pair of porkies and I ain't afraid to show them off when they be required. And as such the need is now, I have brought them out to help to explain to you what a frosty knoll is. You with me so far? Rafferty's companion looked entirely confused, but still nodded his head in hopeful expectancy that the innkeeper might actually make some sense this side of yore. As ugly as easy as might be, they're still very much a part of me. If I didn't have these two, I'd have no choice but to rely on my eyes to hear them. Well, since they're not too sharp at hearing and seeing, I'm grateful to have these ears beside my eyes in case they ever got out of their depth, you see. And while my ears stick out like two nuns in a chicken farm, they have a very important purpose and... What the devil are you talking about? Roared the companion with a head swimming in chicken's eyes and washing lines. You're supposed to be telling me what a frosty knoll is, you fool. That I am, said a slightly indignant Rafferty. If you sit back down and stop waving that fist at me... Hmm, now then, that's better. Where was I? At the start, I think. 
Or was it more towards the end? Seeing the seething rage glowing in his companion's eyes, Rafty continued with what he thought was probably the middle. Anyway, my ears stick out and no mistake. And have you noticed that on a tree's trunk there's always a knobbly bit that sticks out? That there is what you know is, the knobbly bit. And there's the tree standing tall and proud, but trying to hide his knobble. But the knobble has other ideas, and he's not a going anywhere. <laughs> so there's your knob. And what makes it fosty is you being a tad unusual about it. Perhaps you're awkward. Maybe you're embarrassed. Whatever it is, it's there. And so it's very, very fosty. But as you get older and more than a little wiser, you'll come to realise that it's that very same fosty knoll that makes you all the more interesting. And when you know that, and can live happily with it, well then you'll hear all the earth has to say to you. Secrets, wisdom, magic, you name it. So there you have it, my friend. A fosty knoll. Rafferty's companion stared blankly at the old innkeeper for a moment, and then taking the last long swig from his goblet, stood and left the fosty knoll. Well, would you reckon on that? He had a limp too. For over three days, an icy blizzard had been blowing furiously outside the Fosty Knoll Inn. Like a swirling shroud of feathers, the snow had come to completely engulf the small tavern, leaving those inside with little to do but huddle together near the hearth and be thankful they had shelter from the storm. With a huge gust of wind and a dancing swarm of snowflakes, Rafferty Brown stepped through the open door and back into the safety of his home. In his arms were a half a dozen logs he'd gone to fetch from the shed, more fuel for the fire to keep his guests warm. God, it's freezing out there, said the old innkeeper, as he shrugged his coat from his back. Neither fit for man nor beast. At the comment, one of the patrons lifted his head briefly as Rafferty poured himself a glass of mulled wine, and then moved to the fireplace to thaw his frozen hands. Rubbing life back into his fingers, the innkeeper cast a subtle glance at the man sat alone in the corner, seemingly content to remain beyond the glow of the fire. On the chair beside the man was a tattered hat, the like of which Rafferty had never seen before. It was adorned by a single crow's feather, which unfurled proudly from the weathered material. With his fingers and curiosity finally tingling, the proprietor came to sit beside the man. I prefer my own company. Ah, yes, but you can only have your own company if you already have it. And as you don't, I've come to share mine with you. Shaking his head in disdain, the man went back to drinking his ale. It's an interesting feather you have there in your hat. It reminds me of a story I... Do not want to hear your stories, said the man coldly. Excellent. Then I'll begin, said the innkeeper. The winter had been very cruel to the landslide that year. The animals too were suffering. The harvest had failed and the food was short. Rumbling bellies and the cries of hungry children could be heard all over the realm. On one particularly cold day, a lone crow was in flight over the land, viewing the ground for any morsel of food, any small flash of tail would be his next meal. Eventually, the crow came to rest in the arms of a huge oak tree in the centre of a deep forest. Pruning his tatty wings, the crow looked down through the bare branches of the oak and chuckled grimly. What makes you laugh so? says the tired old oak tree. Ah! You, says the crow. Just look at you. Sorry and sad for yourself, with nowhere to go. Ah! Where would I need to go? Arks the tree. I have all I need here. What? Ah! In this miserable forest? Ah! If only you could swoop and soar with the air like me, you would see how wonderful my life is. Ah! Stuck here in the ground with your feet planted in the boring earth. You look pathetic. With wings you could fly so much further. Ah! My roots may have me bound to the soil, little bird, but I will go much further than you. Ah! Is that so? Well, then we'll see, shall we? And with an arrogant swish of his tail feathers, 
the crow leapt into the air to dive a swirl around the tree's trunk, before swooping up graciously into the clouds to make a circle of the surrounding forest. Eventually, flying back to the tree's branch, the crow landed as soft as a whisper and strutted like a king with his wingtips on his hips. What is your name, little crow? Uh, Ignatius. And what's yours, old trunk? Triskelion. Well then, it seems you failed to go further than I, Triskelion. Ah! Trust me, Ignatius. I will go further than you. And despite his show of bravado, the crow was getting angry at this stubborn oak tree. Then tomorrow before dusk, I will show you just how far you can go, tree. Spits Ignatius in rage. And with that, he takes flight and disappeared beyond the horizon. And later that evening, the crow made his way to a small lodge in a lonely part of the forest. An old trail of smoke rose from the ivy-clad chimney, and a low light could be seen through the single window. Coming to land on the sill, the crow tapped furiously at the glass until a confused-looking man emerged from the lodge, scratching his head at the crow's odd behaviour. You there! You're a woodsman, are you not? demands the crow. That I am, though it has put little in my purse and even less in my belly, says the man. I'll make a deal with you, Master Woodsman. Ah! I will tell you where to find the tallest oak in the forest, and you will lay on a feast for me. Oh, aye. That sounds a fair deal to me, agrees the woodsman. And the crow hopped up onto the woodsman's shoulder and whispers of Triskelion, the oak tree. Heading off to fetch his sharpest axe, the woodsman marched off into the forest, leaving behind a rather smug Ignatius the crow. The following morning, Ignatius came to the woodsman's lodge ready for his feast. Below him near the hut lay dozens of freshly hacked logs, wood chippings and broken branches. The woodsman had indeed been busy and had cut and sawn the old stubborn tree into many pieces. Hmph, that'll show you who'll go the furthest. <laughs> well, landing upon the windowsill of the lodge, the crow could already smell the hearth's fire ready to cook his feast. Hopping into the little home, the smug bird cranes his head from left and right, looking for the woodsman, who should be there slaving away and chopping vegetables or sprinkling breadcrumbs on the prepared food. But he was nowhere to be seen. A large black pot stood beside the hearth, presumably where the already made face was waiting to be served. Ignatius hopped up onto the side of the cauldron to sample the food, when out of the darkness leaves the woodsman, who shoves the crow into the pot, covers it with a heavy lid, and placed it on the hearth. <laughs> there would indeed be a feast today, and the crow would be the guest of honour. That winter was particularly cruel, and people got by however they could. But soon winter's grip loosened, and spring arrived with a herald of colour, warmth and sunshine. The morning was bright and cheerful as the woodsman made his way into the forest that day. After an hour's stroll, he came to a small clearing, where stood a tiny oak sapling, already covered in small buds and leaves. Hello, old friend, says the woodsman. Another year, another springtime, Triskelion. Indeed, says the young tree. And it's always good to see you, Rafferty. I brought you a pail of water for your roots, said the young woodsman. Oh, you are good to me, my friend. I don't know what I'd do without you. Oh, you do just fine chuckles the woodsman, scratching behind his oversized ears. It'll not be long before your arms stretch out farther than mine. Hmm, farther than mine. You know, that reminds me of a story. Brilliant, Craig. We loved that one. We did, we did. Let's hope we get to hear more about the mysterious Rafferty in later shows. That was super stuff. Oh, Rafferty's wiser than he looks, isn't he? He certainly is. I shall look forward to hearing more stories. Yeah, <laughs> me too. OK, time for some more music? I think so. I think okay. so. What have we got? Well, do you remember last year we went to see SJ Tucker when she came over to the UK? Oh, yes. What an incredible performer. Wasn't she just? Mm. She had the whole audience singing, laughing and having a thoroughly wonderful time. Yeah, and her songs have got so much magic and myth in them. They're brilliant. And I love the way that she tells a story about everything. She's kind of like half singer and half storyteller. Yes, she is. 
I thought it would be great if we would play her Crystal Cave track about an underworld journey. It's perfect for this time of year. Yes. So let's have a listen to SJ with the track Crystal Cave from her album Haphazard. <laughs> Woke up on a journey, the road ahead in my mind's eye Its lessons universal and its beauty hard to hide And the way it opened for me like the drawbridge of a castle Underneath the tragedy I found the cave of crystal Do not fear the traps you said years ago Now seething to taste your blood Knowledge will not come unless you're bold enough to peek inside Following on us footsteps down To hell with the bumpy ride Following on us footsteps down We'll find what you need in the underground Following on us footsteps down We'll find what you need in the underground So what if the story takes you to where the river's dressed in black And the ferryman will know you by the reaper on your back And the way will open for you like the drawbridge of a castle Wild times ahead before you find Merlin's cave of crystal Where the wrong dragon wing you fly a gust of an idea from the mind Don't you look above for what your heart may find It's been inside you all along, child Hiding inside you so many ways Burning brightly all these days Halloween on us Steps down, we'll find what you need in the underground. Follow the daughter's footsteps down, we'll find you a king in the underground. Follow the lady's footsteps down, we'll leave what you see in the underground. Follow we on us footsteps down, go into the green in the underground. In the underground. your own mind before the sun dies away you'll see your heart's dreams come into play you'll see your heart's dreams come into play you'll see your heart's dreams come into play shining shimmering all these days Halloween on us Steps down, we'll find what you need in the underground. Follow the daughter's footsteps down, we'll find you a king in the underground. Follow the lady's footsteps down, believe what you see in the underground. Follow we nana's footsteps down, we'll find what you need in the underground. In the underground. And that was SJ Tucker with her track Crystal Cave. From the wonderful album, Haphazard. You can find out more about this extremely talented lady in the show notes. Now, by my reckoning, we should have one more piece of music. No, 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 not yet. First, we've got some lovely listener feedback. We had a great email from Heather in Canada. She says, 
I just discovered your show last week and I'm listening to the wooing of Itain as I type this. I know I'm far behind, but I'm listening to two or three podcasts per day, so I should catch up soon. I love your voices. I find it calming and it's awoken my imagination. Sometimes I can envision your settings, a pub, a stream, a battlefield. I try not to when I'm driving, though. Oh, yes. Please be careful when driving, Ella. Yes, please do. Thank you so much for your lovely words, though. We try and see the story in our heads before recording and editing it, so it's really good to hear that you can see it too. You've probably addressed this question in later shows, but it's driving me crazy, so I have to ask. What is it that you say at the end of each show? What does it mean? Ah, well, when we were doing the Irish shows, we said Slongafol, which is Irish Gaelic and means goodbye for now. And now we're doing the Welsh stories. We say Hulvaur, which is Welsh for goodbye and have fun, or great goodbyes. <laughs> I hope that helps, Ella. And thank you so much for your email. Thank you so much for your really kind words. We love getting emails from our listeners, and that was a particular treat, so thank you. But sadly now, we've got to wind up the show with our last piece of music. Oh, yes, yeah. And this is the third of our brand new albums released for the holiday season. Pin back your ears as we rock out the new year with the awesomeness of the mighty Dolmen. Oh, yes. Hold on to your chair and have a listen to the track, Midwinter Dances, from their new album, Witch Lord. If you call, he will hear you. He is in the forest and on the highest mountain.
us right through into the new year and probably keep us going into the next as well <laughs> <laughs> that was the amazing midwinter dances by the dolmen from their fantastic new album witch lord oh now i'm all excited i want to get up and dance that was it. can we have that glance of fizz now yeah why not <laughs> here's to you all may you have a very happy prosperous blessed and above all fantastic Celtic New Year. So we must leave you now with all of our blessings and say, Ulvaum. Well, I thought it would be wonderful to play her. No, I thought it'd be great to play her wonderful crystal track. I can't say this. <laughs> Try again. I thought it'd be attractive, Kay, for her wonderful crystal. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> He's made a crop. And that was SJ Tucker with her trap. Trap. <laughs> and that was SJ Tucker. I suppose you could look at the underworld as a trap. <laughs> You've been listening to the Celtic Myth Pod Show, available from CelticMythPodShow.com. 
We hope you've enjoyed the show and we'll stay tuned for the next episode. You can send us an email or some voice feedback to Gary and Ruth at CelticMythPodshow.com. The show notes for this episode can also be found on the website. We'd like to say a special thank you to Kulan's Hounds, who provided us with the theme music for our show. You can find them at www.sfhounds.com. We'd also like to say a massive thank you to Anne Roos, Kira, Celia, Dave the Bard, The Dolman, Keltoria, Kevin Skinner, Phil Thornton, S.J. Tucker and Spiral Dance. All of these wonderful friends have given us unrestricted access to their music. More details about each of them can be found in the special Friends of the Show page on our website. You'll find links to all of these wonderful artists in the show notes at shownotes.celticmythpodshow.com. <laughs>